Joining us today is Jennifer Stone, and Jen is an amazing physical therapist. She's both an orthopedic PT and a pelvic floor PT, and she's also my mentor, so she's the person I call when I do not (laughs) know the answer to something. So thanks for joining us today, Jen. I'm really excited to be able to just chat at 7 a.m. in the morning, although it, it might be earlier where you're at. It's six. <laughs> six. Okay. So, so we're bringing the early morning. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today, not only as a physical therapist, but also as a mom, because you just recently delivered again mm-hmm. with a history of pelvic organ prolapse. Mm-hmm. And so this is a question that I get a lot from just moms that are really worried, like, okay, I have prolapse. We've made some improvements on it. I'm terrified to get pregnant again and terrified to deliver. So I just want to talk through a little bit of that with you today and kind of just get some information to share to help them from the, I'm a mom, I did it, but I'm also a PT that's really good, so I know what I'm doing (laughs) perspective. (laughs) Sometimes I know what I'm doing. (laughs) You always know what you're doing. So pregnancy, um, pelvic organ prolapse and pregnancy. Do you have any special precautions or things to think about other than the things that we're already working on, like pressure management, adequate pelvic floor strength, is there anything in particular with pregnancy that you would like to mention or bring up? Well, I think it's important for people to think about, you know, with pregnancy can come things like constipation. So Mm -hmm. I always recommend, and I did this myself, that people really focus on making sure their bowels keep moving because between hormone changes and then of course the presence of an ever enlarging structure and Mm -hmm. person inside of you, um, you can just have some constipation that comes along with that. So even if that's not something that you typically have to manage really specifically, it might become important in pregnancy. But honestly, other than that, you know, you correctly pointed out that prolapse is really more about pressure management than anything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you learn how to control your pressures correctly, it is a little bit harder with baby because there's more weight on the pelvic floor. And that is a weight that's pretty well directly on the pelvic floor. (laughs) But if you know how to do it and you keep working, you know, the nice thing is that weight on the pelvic floor doesn't come overnight. You have nine months where it's slowly, or hopefully about nine months where it's slowly increasing. So if you continually work on it throughout pregnancy, you should be able to adjust your muscles and your pressure management strategies as the baby grows and not have it get worse. Um, And we are talking about, you know, anterior and posterior prolapse, not uterine prolapse is sort of a different category. Um, But I have helped women have successful pregnancies and deliveries after even after a uterine prolapse as well so what you're saying is as long as we're on top of our game with being able to feel what's going on in our body because i find that you it's really hard to manage pressure if you can't feel what's going on so being Mm -hmm. on top of that being on top of that pressure management being on top of not straining to go to the bathroom so managing constipation then the actual act of getting pregnant we can have a little bit of relief there Mm -hmm for it not being super scary and uh, causing lots of setbacks. I really like to um, throw in the exercise modification a little bit earlier with the pelvic organ prolapse because of the ligament laxity. And I just find that things are, they wanna stretch out really quickly if they already know how to do it. Um, And so making sure that we rein it in a little bit for my really high level ladies that are are bringing the high pressure sports, it, it might be something that we have to back off. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So now the big question comes, and I'm sure the question you get so frequently is, should I opt for the C-section or should I have the vaginal delivery? What are the pros and cons? Um, is this a question you also get a lot from? I do, and you know, it's it's not something where I feel like we can have a one size fits all answer mm-hmm. because there's so much. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, you know, your personal values and what you feel comfortable with go into that. Um, the severity of your prolapse goes into that, whether you've been able to manage your symptoms during pregnancy or before pregnancy, um, all kinds of factors. But I do think, you know, I think it's interesting. I believe that pre- really pregnancy and delivery sort of get maybe a not completely deserved bad rap when it comes to, um, well, and specifically vaginal delivery when it comes to prolapse. 
Um, because a lot of, and the reason for that is because a lot of our studies where we look at what are some of the risk factors for prolapse, it is more common in women who have had at least one child. But prolapse is also more common as we become older. And so, you know, as we get older, there's just the likelihood of us having at least one child does increase as well. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's as simple. And I also think, you know, from a physiologic standpoint, we don't have studies on this because nobody's looked at it because it's really hard to do studies on pregnant women Mm -hmm. uh, for a good reason. But I think we have to think about, too, from a physiologic standpoint, even if you have kind of a tough delivery where you're pushing for a long time, the amount of pressure that you're generating during that activity is completely, you know, if you compare that to maybe having a lifetime of uh, of difficulty with bowel movements and constipation and the amount of straining you do with that, I just don't even think those two can really compare. Mm-hmm. You know, and and when you're delivering, there's all kinds of hormonal things going on. That might be in a slight understatement. Um, but, you know, those hormonal things are designed to allow our muscles to elongate, to mm-hmm. triple their normal length or more in some cases, and then rebound. We don't have that same thing with other high pressure situations that we put ourselves in, whether that would be constipation, lifting with poor technique, um, mm-hmm. any of those things. So, and I also think it's interesting that most studies do not show that rate of prolapse increases with a greater number of children. So your relative risk if you've had four or five children is not necessarily any higher than someone who's had one. Now, after a certain point, it does increase if you've had more than 10 children, but most women haven't. And even then, it's a very, very small increase to the point where I'm not sure that we can look at that and absolutely conclude that the delivery was the only factor in that. Well, and it does seem not always because, I mean, my second delivery was a little bit harder than my first, but for most women, the the next deliveries that come out seem to be a little bit easier. The babies, mm-hmm. you know, the first one's paved the way, things have already yeah. gotten stretched out. Like, so there's not quite, uh, you know, maybe the extreme of pressure and straining that comes with the first one. Yeah. I'd agree. And the other thing I think we need to remember, you know, it's interesting about, oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was this whole thought process that went across the obstetric community where physicians were offering women elective, elective cesarean, sorry, it is early, <laughs> um, it's but, really early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were offering that with the thought process that, oh, this spares your pelvic floor because you're not pushing a baby through it. Mm-hmm. Well, in reality, it's true that you're not pushing a baby through your pelvic floor, but cesareans create scar tissue and you cut through the abdominals. And now with with what we know now about the way that core stability and pressure regulation actually works, we need ideal abdominal function. We need Mm -hmm. ideal pelvic floor function and we need to have balance between those two. Especially those lower abs. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, uh, it really plays in with the pelvic floor. Mm-hmm. And since it isn't currently standard care in America for women to receive physical therapy after that major abdominal surgery, mm-hmm. you can ask me what, what my soapbox is on that. <laughs> um, I'm sure everyone can guess. Um, but yeah, since, since that's not the case, typically and frequently women who have cesareans do not necessarily go back to having that ideal balance and strategy um, and control with those lower abdominals. And even if they could, from a muscle standpoint, often they're not given any instructions about scar management. And so Mm -hmm. then you have those adhesions that can form that can prevent them from being able to access those abdominals, even if they might have otherwise. So I think we need to be a little bit cautious with this idea of, oh, well, if you have a C-section, then that's better for your pelvic floor than Mm -hmm. a vaginal delivery. Now, granted, a C-section is better for your pelvic floor than a vaginal delivery with, say, a fourth degree tear. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of women are not going to be high risk for that. And even the studies that we have on women who have had a previous fourth degree tear, they don't necessarily repeat that upon a repeat vaginal delivery. Uh, So, you know, I think that we just need to be a little bit careful with not making the research say things that it doesn't say and with Mm -hmm. realizing that a C-section comes with an impact on the person's body as well. And that may or may not be any better. Mm -hmm. No, that's really, that's very valid points, especially for the women that are, that are terrified to deliver again after that first Mm -hmm. delivery. So going back, just a real quick point on the scar management. So even if they did tear with the first delivery, making sure they go see pelvic floor PT, making sure they get in to get that scar worked on so that they have some tissue, to sensibility, 
for that next subsequent delivery would also be really helpful. <laughs> We're looking oh, at yeah, absolutely. I mean, in my own personal history, I definitely have a vested interest in this. With my first delivery, mm-hmm. I had a fourth degree tear um, and did a lot of research trying to decide what I should do for subsequent deliveries because the suggestion I was given following that repair was you need to have an elective cesarean at 35 weeks to make sure that you don't go into labor because I also delivered my first baby in 45 minutes start to finish. So they were like, if you go into labor, we may not have time to do a C-section. So we're doing it before you would possibly go into labor. And I wasn't super comfortable with the idea of pulling a baby out five weeks early if we didn't really have to, unless it was one of the, like if it really was that big of a deal for my body, maybe. And, you know, the research I found really didn't seem to support the idea of, you know, that this will necessarily be a repeat occurrence or the idea that you will have a greater likelihood of issues down the road with things like um, fecal incontinence and that sort of thing. Everything I read really made it sound like either we don't know, which Mm -hmm. is fair, um, or that the likelihood of problems down the road really doesn't change much with a subsequent delivery. So I went on to have three more vaginal deliveries, the most recent of which was fairly recently. Um, And I had my prolapse occurred after the second delivery and has not recurred since. So I've had two pregnancies, including a very, my my last pregnancy baby was 10 pounds, four ounces when she was born. So including a very large baby, a lot, she had a lot of amniotic fluid. So I actually lost 25 pounds uh, from Uh pre-delivery to immediately after delivery. So, you know, just to let you know how much my uterus was actually carrying and did not have any issues with recurrence of prolapse with either of those. And granted, that's a single case. It's not, it doesn't Mm -hmm. hold as much weight as a big study, but but we don't have big studies. Yes, yes. This is, it's a story where we talk to someone who has gone on to have multiple deliveries and pregnancies post-prolapse and have success. I mean, from what I heard, you had a fairly easy delivery and things went well and your body's feeling pretty good and you're happy and back to work. (laughs) You're you're giving us hope that we can do it. Um, Mm -hmm. One more thing I'd like to talk about. I know how you you like it when I spring random questions at you. (laughs) I think one of the things that increased my prolapse with the second was his head positioning, hand being stuck up by his face, just, just too much trying to come through, but was also pushing too early. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want to talk to us a little bit about maybe some things to consider for optimal delivery environments? (laughs) Yeah, sure. And, you know, again, this is going to vary a lot from person to person. Mm -hmm. I by no means would tell people that they have to deliver a specific way because some people Mm -hmm. don't want to or they don't feel they are able or things happen. You know, there's a lot of things that happen during deliveries that we just can't predict. But there can be so much pressure. I kind of look back at my because a lot of the things I thought I wanted either didn't apply or they ended up not working for various reasons. There can be so much pressure. It's like, oh, there's, you know, I had midwives and they were great, but they were like, we're full. Like, okay, we have a minute. You need to start pushing now. And it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, and again, I, I definitely don't ever want any woman to think that she's less than because of the way she delivered. I mm-hmm. think an unfortunate part of the support that is rising for things like natural deliveries is that some women can feel like, oh, well, if I had an epidural, I didn't, I wasn't as much of a um, of a superhero as the person who didn't or something mm-hmm. like that or oh if I had a c-section for whatever reason they had a c-section that was a failure and that's not true you know you however mm-hmm. you delivered your baby you are really a rock star um, just for having that baby I that think it's the growing the baby that's <laughs> really the yeah. rough part <laughs> right yeah but yes um, I mean I think things like laboring down as much as possible, um, which just means waiting to push until you really have this urge that you can't, um, that you can't really resist kind of thing. And if you do have a strong epidural, might not feel that urge. So, you know, it's just one of those things where you may have to go a little bit more off of things that your providers are seeing, such as where baby's station is and that sort of thing. Um, thankfully, I do think there's been more acceptance in most hospital settings of the idea of letting mom labor down because they know that makes that second stage of labor a lot easier. Um, And then if you're able to change positions, again, that's not as likely if you have an epidural, but if you're able to change positions and move around, I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then the biggest thing I think is not holding your breath while you're pushing. Mm 
<laughs> that whole purple pushing thing of take a deep breath and hold it and then bear down with all your might as I count to 10. Um, that's not really helpful. And as long as baby is not in distress, it's not beneficial for either baby or mom. They've done some interesting studies looking at newborn oxygenation right after delivery. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, shock shockingly, it's not as good in the moms who held their breath during pushing because what you breathe is what your baby breathes until they're out of your body. Um, and so if, as long as there's not some reason from baby's standpoint to get them out of there really quickly, which mm -hmm. your doctor or midwife or whoever your provider is should let you know if that's the case, then, you know, having mom breathe through pushing, you know, taking deep breaths and gently bearing down um, while, you know, making some noises is kind of ideal. And, you know, I often have women who either have had really bad tears or have experienced prolapse between deliveries come see me while they're pregnant. And I work with them on learning how to push. And I have them practice that mm -hmm. while they're actually still pregnant so that then they have this motor control and this awareness of how to push without straining. Mm -hmm. And then even if they do have an epidural and they can't necessarily feel things, their body has that association of, okay, this is what you're trying to do and it should do it anyway. And again, this is not a big published study, but I've done it with 34 women so far, and so far none of them have had any tearing or any prolapse. And our hospital's rate of repeat tearing on moms who've had a tear before is something around 45%. So it's at least better odds than that. So. Mm -hmm. Yay, that's really helpful. I think, I mean, I was given the advice of, I was told to hold my breath and push. I think that's that's standard and... It is. Most places, yeah. and I, I even had a midwife. <laughs> yeah. So that advice is great. Okay, so anything else that you want to add to this conversation just to help women make more informed decisions, feel safer, um, have more confidence? Well, I just, I think that you need to do what makes you feel more comfortable. So if that's seeing someone who can, not your OBGYN, but someone who actually works with the pelvic floor muscles while you're pregnant mm -hmm. so that they can actually tell you what, what is your control like, um, or, or what factors do you need to consider? Um, yeah, and I say not your OBGYN, I have all the respect in the world for OBGYNs and midwives and everyone who does that work, but they, none of them are really trained on muscle control mm -hmm. at all. And they'll tell you that, you know, the ones that we work with here will tell me all the time, yeah, I have no idea. I can maybe sort of tell if the muscles are tight or not, but I really don't know how to evaluate how the person is using them. Uh, and that's why they end up sending their patients to me to, to talk about mm -hmm. that. And so I think just, you know, find out what your situation actually is. You know, prolapse is scary and it can, mm -hmm. it can feel really devastating as a woman to have that part of your body doing something that feels and looks kind of crazy, you know, and I know a lot about prolapse. And when my first, when I first developed mine, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's completely normal. But I think that what gives you back that power is, no, first of all, knowing, you know, how bad is it actually? Because it may not be that as big of a deal as it feels to you in the sense of, oh, this may be something that's pretty easily reversible. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just having that agency and that power of knowing how to work on it and how to, um, how to make it better is very important and very helpful, I think. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my biggest thing is just what do you need to do to take the fear out of the equation mm -hmm. and do that because you're worth it. Your body is worth it and your, your emotions and your heart are worth, worth it. And, yeah, I think it's very common, especially in the U.S. where both you and I live, for moms to be put last. You know, I, I saw mm -hmm. a really, really sad blog post the other day that was talking about this mom's postpartum experience and how, you know, she went to all these appointments for her babies um, and she got a very cursory six week, oh, you're fine check where nobody even really looked that closely at her body. Mm -hmm. And she, one of the comments that she made was, yep, that's when I learned my place in my family, dead last. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh man. And it, it is, it's, that's the message that we're often sending our mothers. And it's extremely unfortunate because mom, you know, mom's the one that's holding up the rest of the family. If anything, we should be putting her and her support first. And unfortunately we don't have those social structures right now. So we as mothers have to advocate for that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I would love for every woman to go see a pelvic floor PT after she delivers. You would in most other first world countries that would just happen automatically here. You have to ask for it, but if you ask for it, you can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super helpful just again. So, you know, your situation, you know what to do. 
to have your body return to functioning as optimally as possible. And just knowing that that support is important and it is not that your body isn't doing something right. It's just, you did a big thing. You Mm -hmm. might need some help recovering afterward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think looking at it as what helped me was looking at it as an orthopedic injury, just like any other. And we're trained in muscles and they're pelvic floor muscles. And it takes a little bit of the scariness out of the prolapse and the diagnosis. And I mean, because you wouldn't be scared if you're rehabbing an ACL tear or an ankle sprain or, you know, whatever else needs to be rehabbed. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of scary language out there. Don't Google mm-hmm. prolapse. Just don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Unless you're on my website and then you can look at all the articles on prolapse. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and because I, I hate to say this, but to some extent, those scare tactics are marketing strategies. Um, it's a way for companies to sell products, whether that is continence products or, you know, there are products that are made to insert while you exercise and that sort of thing. And it is also a way for surgeons to sell surgery, surgical repairs. And there is a place for surgical repairs, absolutely. Um, But it's not that every woman who has any prolapse at all needs a repair. We were talking about that the other day. Was the women that we've seen that have barely a grade two prolapse that are told they need surgery and we're both like what (laughs) don't do it (laughs) and that some some prolapse after delivery can be completely normal and you just need to get good rehab and okay so I know the next question that I'm gonna get asked is where are you located where is your clinic so do you mind telling everybody because I'm sure everybody in the area is gonna want to come see you now (laughs) Yeah, my clinic is in Columbia, Missouri, so it's a little tiny town. It's not a tiny town. It's a fairly small college town in the middle of the Midwest. Uh, But there are wonderful pelvic floor PTs in most states. Mm -hmm. I will say it is an underserved area, so unfortunately, depending on where people live, they may have to drive a ways to access one. Uh, But there should be someone within a relatively reasonable driving distance who can be helpful Um, Well, and thanks to people like you who educate people like me, (laughs) you are, you are helping change the world. So thank you for everything you do. You too. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Jen.